in the words of Francis of Assisi when he met Brother Dominic on the road to Umbria. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My hometown is Brooklyn, New York, and one of the things that we Brooklynites do is speak very, very fast. So, if you find me speaking too quickly, I'd ask you either to throw fruit up here, or wave your arms, or walk out the door, or start yelling, boo, 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 so that we'll be able to keep up with the translators, okay? When I was a little boy, growing up in the streets of Brooklyn, I had a little friend a Jewish kid named Saul, and when the weather was warm, we'd go up to McKinley Park, we had, had on overalls and t-shirts, we each had a bucket and a shovel, we'd sit in the sand pile and play, and chatter away about what we were going to do with our lives when we got big. We became quite close, but as the years passed, our paths parted. In 1850, the Korean War came along, I was a sophomore in the university, <clears throat> kind of going nowhere. I dropped out, I enlisted in the Marine Corps, so I went in the Army. When the war ended, he went on to law school and married. I got engaged to be married, but the Lord dropped the bomb into my tight little world. I wound up in a Franciscan seminary and got ordained a priest. Some eight years had passed since Saul and I had seen one another, when one day, apparently by coincidence, we met on the streets of Brooklyn, we had an animated conversation, and in the course of it he told me that he'd recently become a convert from the Jewish faith to Christianity. Well, I was intrigued to learn how a Jew looks at Jesus, another Jew, because Jews, in their Semitic thought patterns, tend to be much more creative, poetic, and imaginative than we comparatively stayed literalistic Westerners. So I asked him, Saul, what's your understanding of Jesus? He said, let me think about it, I'll tell you tomorrow. So we met the next day, woke up to McKinley Park, sat down in the sand pile, and what he told me moved me so deeply that I urged him to have it published, which he did a year later. It is now read in 32 languages all over the world has become the largest selling book in the history of the Harper and Row Publishing Company. And I'm sure that many of you here this morning are familiar with it. Here, Saul, pen name Shell Silverstein said, is my understanding of Jesus Christ. Once upon a time there was a tree, and she loved a boy, and the boy loved the tree. Every day he would come and climb up her trunk, swing from her branches, eat her apples. When he was tired, he'd lie in her shade. When he was active, they'd play hide-and-go-seek. One day, the boy carved in the trunk of the tree, Tree, I love thee, and that made the tree very happy. But for some reason, the boy stayed away two whole days. When he came back, the tree was so happy, she literally shook with joy. She said, come boy, climb up my trunk, swing from my branches, eat apples, and be happy. The boy said, uh-uh. In the last two days, I found out what real fun is like. So I need some money. You got any money? I have no money, said the tree. But pluck all my apples. Sell them in the city. Get money and be happy. So the boy plucked all her apples, and he went away, and the tree was happy. But now the boy stayed away a month. When he came back, the tree was so happy, she could hardly speak. She said, come boy, climb up my trunk, swing from my branches, and be happy. Life's a lot more serious than fun and games, the boy said. I want to get married, settle down and have a family. So I need a house. Can you give me a house? The forest is my house, said the tree. But cut down my branches, boy, and build a house. The boy cut down all her branches 
and he went away, and the tree was happy, but not really. A year passed. Finally, the boy returned. The tree said, come, boy, climb up my trunk and be happy. Yuck. I am bored. I am disgusted with life. I want to get away to a foreign country. So I need a boat. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and build a boat, said the tree. The boy cut down her trunk and he sailed away. Forty years later, when he returned, the tree looked up and said, But I have no apples. There's nothing to eat. My teeth are too weak to chew, said the boy. I have no branches you can't swing. I'm too tired to swing. I have no trunk you can't climb. I'm too old to climb. I'm sorry, said the tree. I have nothing to give you. Oh, I don't need very much anymore, the boy said. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. And the tree, straightening herself up as majestically as she could, said, Well, an old stump is good for something. Come, boy, sit and rest. And the boy did, and the tree was happy. And that's all Silverstein said, is my understanding of Jesus Christ. In his beautiful modern parable, which he calls the giving tree, when the tree freely surrenders her apples, her branches, and her trunk, Saul said, I'm reminded of Jesus, of whom Paul wrote in Philippians, he emptied himself. He cried out his heart, nailed up his hands, and poured out his blood to help us believe that he loves us. Significantly, Jesus chose the giving tree of his cross as the demonstrative sign of his absolute love for men and women, a love that did not count death to high a price, or in the words of Cyril of Jerusalem, the mightiest act of love ever to arise from a human soul. So, do you see how goofy, how wacky, how crazy it is ever to imagine that Christianity consists primarily in what we do for God. You know, the poor, pitiful, puny things we sometimes manage to do for Him, and we trudge along joylessly, making these wearisome little sacrifices, like going to church on Sunday, reading the Bible now and then, coming to an annual conference for the European Youth for Christ. God must be overwhelmed that we got here. <laughs> Christianity never begins with what we do for God. It always starts with what God does for us. The great wondrous things that God dreamed up and achieved for us in Christ Jesus. This morning when the Lord comes streaming into your life in the power of his word and the fellowship of his faith community, all he asks is that you be astonished that he bothered to come to you at all. The next time you look at a cross and learn at what price you are loved, all God asks is that you marvel, be surprised, let your mouth hang open, and begin to breathe deeply. If you'd like to benefit most from our meeting this morning, I would suggest that from this moment, until you put your head on the pillow tonight, you let the focus of your inner life rest on one truth. 
the staggering, mind-blowing truth that God loves you just as you are and not as you should be because nobody in this room is as they should be. That God loves you, not the person next to you, not that God loves Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, not that God loves the church, the world, not that God loves in some vague way the whole human race, but the truth that God loves you in such a way that he'd rather die than be without you. Isn't it difficult to believe you're worth the death of anyone? Least of all the all-holy God. I'm sure it's crossed your mind that since God alone made you, with a little help from your parents, of course, God alone knows what response he's looking for from you and how many people's destinies depend on yours. So when you scorn yourself, put yourself down and say, but I'm a clod man, I'm a loser, I'm a wrong person. If you ever got to know the real me, you wouldn't want to know me. There is so much phoniness, so much pretense, so much hypocrisy, and the self-talk continues, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, guess I'll go eat worms. <laughs> when you scorn yourself, then you scorn all those plans of his, all the dreams he was going to realize through you, all the joy he anticipated from you, and all the hope that he placed in you. Self-hatred is an indecent luxury that no disciple can afford because self-hatred subtly establishes me as the center of my focus and concern, and biblically, that's idolatry. I just ask you to reflect for a moment on the image that you have of yourself right now before the Lord Jesus. I think it's accurate to say that every person here is getting a different kind of feedback from the risen Christ. In my travels throughout the United States and Europe, I have come to see with great clarity that the biggest single mistake that we North American Christians make is this. It's an attitude, a mindset that says, if I change, then God will love me. You ever found yourself thinking this way? If I can just try a little harder, run a little faster, squeeze all those lustful, judgmental thoughts out of my mind, if I can just develop a much more disciplined prayer life, if I can love others unconditionally, ah, then God will love me. If you're thinking that way, you run the run from the Lord, His arms can never reach out and embrace you. I remember one morning I woke up, I promised God, this is going to be a perfect day. I was going to be so kind, so patient, so compassionate, thoughtful, generous, wise, and loving that I was going to make Francis of Assisi look like a piker. <laughs> that night I'm kneeling beside my bed, beating my chest. I'm a sewer, I'm a sewer, I'm a great big cesspool. In my own misguided way, I was saying, Jesus, if I change, you love me, won't you? And because I was always trying to change, always trying to become perfect, as you can see, I never made it. Every time we say to the Lord, if I change, you'll love me, won't you? Jesus says, wait a minute, you got it backwards. You don't have to change, so I love you. I love you, so you'll change. Once you know how deeply, tenderly, relentlessly, passionately you're loved, Change will follow in your life, but you don't have to change, grow, or be good to be loved. You're loved that you will change, grow, and be good. When I was 22 years old, I was engaged to a girl named Barbara from Brooklyn. On the first anniversary of our engagement, we go to a fancy restaurant down by the water, romantic, candlelight, little bottle of French wine. No sooner sit down than Barbara says to me, i got to tell you something. I said, what? She said, your table manners are gross, man. Really gross. You eat a meal like the Russians are out there on the expressway. You scarf down the food. 
You don't pass the salt and pepper. You don't even talk to me. You are really rude. You know, I was delighted to hear it. I don't say this boastfully, but I knew Barbara loved me as I was, not as I was supposed to be. However, was I motivated? I didn't say I have to, I got to, I ought, I must, or I should. I said I want to improve my table etiquette because I knew that I was loved. You don't have to change, grow, be good to be loved by the Lord Jesus. Your love that you will change, grow, and be good. When you reflect on the unrestricted love of God, it's good to turn the pages of the Gospels, focus on characters you meet there because they're people just like ourselves, like Peter the Rock, who proved to be a sandpile, a loudmouth who three times denied ever even knowing the one man who loved him most. There was Zacchaeus, the little runt who built an ivory tower out of stolen money, and then the sinful woman in the home of Simon the Pharisee, a hooker. James and John, classic cases of mama's boys. <laughs> Anytime they wanted any of them, Jesus, they sent their mother. <laughs> Could my two little boys sit on your right hand and your left when you come into your kingdom? With a great sense of humor, Jesus nicknamed the two of them Boanerges, the sons of thunder. And Thomas, Thomas, all-star, stubborn bullhead, spent most of his Christian life doubting and Martha, Martha, twitch, warrior, complainer, who's going to get dinner ready? How are we going to make ends meet this week? Who's going to push my wheelchair when I get old? <laughs> the woman in adultery, a very frightened lady, till Jesus saved her life and forgave her sin. Saul of Tarsus, hell-bent on destroying Christianity, till he took that road to Damascus, and met a loving Lord. Why is it good, important, to focus on these biblical characters? Because God was in Jesus, affirming them all, forgiving them all, enabling them all, challenging them all the way in the fullness of life. And that Jesus, who was the same yesterday <clears throat> in Galilee, today here in Nantwich, forever in the kingdom, is challenging you and me to the very same realities, to let go of our idols, our superstitions, our cowardice, our gods of human manufacturing, to stop projecting onto Jesus our own hateful feelings toward ourselves, and to open to, surrender to the God bodied forth in Jesus, who comes, sits by your side, and says, I dare you to trust that I love you just as you are and not as you should be. I came across an image of God in secular literature recently that is so much closer to the gospel than a lot of the rantings and ravings of our televangelists. It's a scene from Nikos Kazantzakis' novel Letters to Greco. The scene is an old man dying in a hovel. He's filled with guilt, shame, remorse, self-condemnation because of the sins of his past life, mostly sexual, and he's terrified at the prospect of judgment. Well, the old guy dies, he goes before the judgment seat of the Lord, and at Jesus' right hand is a big bowl of aromatic oil. Jesus dips a sponge into the bowl of aromatic oil and wipes the terrified old man clean of his fear and his guilt and his shame. And then Jesus says to the old guy, Don't bother me with that stuff. Now come over and play. And for many of us, the good news just seems too good to be true. Why? Because the love of God incarnate in Jesus is radically different from our natural and human way of loving. When I love as a man, I'm drawn, I'm attracted to certain persons and things. For example, I love the Jersey Shore and Clearwater Beach at Sunset. I love Handel's Messiah, Hot Fight Sundays, my wife Rosalind. There's a common denominator, better, a common dynamic at work in all of them. I'm drawn, I'm attracted to certain persons and things that I find congenial and appealing. So, when I love as a man, 
I love someone for what I find in him or her. But, unlike ourselves, the God and Father of Jesus loves men and women not for what he finds in them, but for what he finds in himself. It is not because men and women are good that he loves them, nor only good men and women that he loves. It's because he is so unspeakably, unutterably, unimaginably good that the God and Father of Jesus loves all men and women, even sinners. He does not detect what is congenial, attractive, and appealing, and then respond to it with his favor. He doesn't respond at all, for the God of Jesus is a source. He acts, he does not react. He initiates love, he is love without motive, and because his love is creative, it originates good rather than rewarding it. That's why St. Augustine could write those lyrical lines, Quia amastime, fecisti me amabilem. In loving me, you made me lovable. Why is Brennan Manning lovable in the eyes of God? Because 44 years ago, in a shattering, life-changing encounter, in 1856, I committed my life to Christ. Does God love me because for the last 37 years, I've roamed the world preaching the... Does God love me because I spend two hours every day in prayer? Does God love me because back home in New Orleans I work on Skid Row with alcoholics, uh, addicts, and persons suffering with AIDS? Does God love me because I tithe to the poor? Does God love me because I am rigorously faithful to my wife Rosalind and try to be a loving stepfather to our two girls? If I believe that stuff, I'm a Pharisee then I feel I'm entitled to be comfortably close to Christ because of my good works. The gospel of grace says, Brennan, you're lovable for one reason only, because God loves you, period. Hard as this is for us to grasp, because we neither give nor receive love among ourselves in this fashion, yet we believe because of the life, death, and resurrection of the carpenter Messiah, that his God, his Father, his Abba, is more loving, forgiving, and cherishing than Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob ever would have dreamt. All these words of mine, simply to restate what it says in every page of the Christian scriptures, the God and Father of Jesus is gracious. He loves us in a way that defies human comprehension and escapes human imitation. And that is why I can stand here this morning and with theological certainty in the power of the word proclaim God loves you unconditionally as you are and not as you should be because once again nobody in the building is as they should be. Do you believe this? I've not asked a Christian in 20 years. Do you know God loves you? Who's not replied? Oh yeah, yeah, known that for a long time. And 99% don't believe it. They don't know it, except in some vague, distant, abstract way. They'd be hard-pressed to say that right now the essence of their Christian life is a love affair, and not just a simple love affair, but a furious love affair going on between Christ and themselves at this very moment. Do you honestly believe that with all the wrong turns you made in your past, the mistakes the detours, the moments of sin and selfishness and degraded love that God has used them all to bring you to where you are right now and the word says you are standing on holy ground. Do you sincerely believe that the God in Jesus loves you beyond worthiness and unworthiness, beyond fidelity and infidelity, that he loves you in the morning sun and the evening rain without caution, regret, Boundary, limit, breaking point, no matter what's gone down, he can't stop loving you. If you don't fully embrace that, you're living a life of illusion, superstition, cowardice, and once again, 
projecting onto Jesus your own negative feelings toward yourself. Biblically, to believe in the love of God means to accept with my head and my heart that God loves me in a creative, intimate, unique, reliable, and tender way. Creative, out of his love I came forth. Through his love I'm sustained in existence. In fact, my next heartbeat is loving gift in the Father's hand. His love is intimate. Do you have a skeleton in your closet from your past life? Something you did so shameful, so selfish, so mean, that even now when you think about it, your palms start to perspire, and you say, please God, don't let anybody ever find out about that. The intimate love of God reaches into that dark place. You know, in the Bible, reconciliation is not primarily making peace with someone else. First of all, it's making peace in that part of yourself where you could never find peace before. Such is the intimate love of God. His love is unique, meaning God loves me not as you think I am or as I think I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be, but as I really am. And the real Brennan Manning is a bundle of paradoxes and contradictions. I believe in God with all my heart, but on a given day when I see a seven-year-old girl raped and murdered by a sex maniac or a four-year-old boy slaughtered by a drunken driver, I wonder if God exists. I trust him and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty if I don't feel guilty. I'm wide open and I'm locked in. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. <laughs> That's the real Brennan. And God's unique love reached out to embrace me as I am and not as I should be. His love is reliable, meaning it has never let me down. I'm sure of this. If we have the opportunity to share your life story and mine, we'll discover a striking similarity in at least one respect. Both of our lives have been a celebration of God's faithfulness in good times and in bad. It was just a little over 25 years ago. It was April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1975. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, I woke up in a doorway on Commercial Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I woke up in an alcoholic fog, sniffing vomit all over my sweater, staring down at my bare feet. I didn't know a wino had stolen my shoes during the night to buy a bottle of Thunderbird. And come along the sidewalk is a woman, maybe 25 years old, with blonde hair, attractive lady. She had her four-year-old son in her hand. The boy broke loose from his mother's grip, ran over to the doorway, and stared down at me. His mother came up quickly behind him, cupped her hands over his eyes, and said, Don't look at that filth. All that is, is pure filth. Twenty-five years ago, that filth was Brennan Manning. And the God I've come to know by grace, the Jesus that I've met on my own journey, Love me as much that morning in this state of disgrace as he does this morning in the state of grace. For his love is never, never, never based on our performance, never conditioned by our moods of elation or depression. It knows no shadow of alteration or change. The love of God in Christ Jesus is reliable. And his love is tender. Tenderness is what happens to you when you know you're deeply and sincerely liked by somebody. If you communicate to me that you really like me, not just love me as a brother in Christ, but really like me, then you open up to me the possibility of liking myself, accepting myself, loving myself. The look in your eyes banishes my fears and my defense mechanisms like sarcasm, ridicule, name-dropping, giving you the appearance I've got it all together. All that falls away. If I sense you like me, I'll become more open, sincere, vulnerable, and affectionate with you than I'd ever dream of being 
if I thought you didn't like me, what happens is I grow tender. My friend Ed Farrell in Detroit goes on his two weeks on a va vacation to Ireland. The reason, his favorite uncle is celebrating his 80th birthday. Well, on the morning of the great day, Ed and his uncle get up before dawn, they get dressed in the darkness and silence, and they go for a walk around the shores of Lake Killarney. Just as the sun is about to rise, his uncle turns and stares straight at the rising sun. Ed Farrell didn't know what to do. So he stands beside his uncle, shoulder to shoulder, 20 full minutes, not a word exchanged, and then his uncle, his 80-year-old uncle, goes skipping down the road, and he's beaming, radiant, smiling ear to ear, and Ed Farrell said, Uncle Seamus, you really look happy. He said, I am, lad. Uh, you want to tell me why? Yes, you see. And the tears just washed down the old man's face. You see, the father is very fond of me. Oh, me father is so very fond of me. If I asked you right now, do you really believe God likes you, not loves you? Because theologically, God has to love you. <laughs> God loves by necessity of nature. Without the eternal interior generation of love, God would cease to be God. If I asked, do you really believe he likes you? And with gut level honesty, you could reply, oh yes. The Father is very fond of me. There would come a relaxedness, a serenity, a compassionate attitude toward yourself in your brokenness, and you'd be very close to what I describe in one of my books as living one day at a time in the wisdom of accepted tenderness. Living each day in the wisdom of accepted tenderness tenderness. In the 44 years since I was first ambushed by Jesus in a little chapel up in the Allegheny Mountains of western Pennsylvania and in the thousands of hours of silence, solitude, prayer, meditation over those years, I am utterly convinced that on Judgment Day, the Lord Jesus is going to ask each of us one question, and only one question. Did you believe that I loved you? That I desired you? That I waited for you day after day? That I longed to hear the sound of your voice? The real believers there will answer, yes, Jesus, I believed in your love. And I tried to shape my life as a response to it. But many of us who go to church every Sunday and work diligently in the ministry are going to have to reply, well, uh, frankly, no, sir. I mean, I never really believed it. Oh, I heard a lot of wonderful sermons and teachings about it. I remember one frigid day there in Nantwich. At some Youth for Christ meeting, there was this old, white-haired, wild-eyed guy raving about it. I even had a sign hanging in my kitchen and said, Smile, God loves you. But I always thought that was just, you know, a way of speaking, a kindly lie, some Christian's pious pat on the back to cheer me on. And there's the difference between the real believers and the nominal Christians that abound in our churches across the land. No one can measure like a believer the depth and the intensity of God's love but at the same time, no one can measure like a believer the effectiveness of our gloom, pessimism, self-pity, self-hatred, and despair that block God's way to us. Do you see why it is so important to lay hold of this basic truth of our faith? Because you're only going to be as big as your own concept of God. Remember the famous line of the French philosopher Blaise Pascal? God made man in his own image, and man returned the compliment. 
But he often made God in our own image. He wants us to be as fussy, rude, narrow-minded, judgmental, unforgiving, unloving as we are. In the last couple of three years, I have preached the gospel to the financial community on Wall Street in New York City, the airmen and women of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, a thousand physicians in Nairobi, Africa, spoke at the Greenbelt Conference here in England. I've been to churches in Bangor, Maine, in Miami, in Seattle, and uh, San Diego. Honest, the God of so many Christians I meet is a God who is too small for me. Because he is not the God of the Word. He is not the God revealed by it in Jesus Christ who loves us as we are and not as we should be. After I was ordained in May of 63, I taught theology at the University of Ohio for three years. Then went on to complete more graduate school at Columbia University in New York City, Catholic U in Washington, D.C. Then I started teaching graduate school and really began to take myself quite seriously. But I soon became disenchanted with the phoniness in my life, the feeling I was making an academic career out of the priesthood. So I took a two-year leave of absence. I came over here to Europe, and I joined a community called the Little Brothers of Jesus, uh, founded by Charles de Foucault, Les Petits Frères de Jésus. And I worked as a dishwasher in France, I was a construction worker in Spain. I lived voluntarily as a prisoner in a uh, prison in Freiburg, Switzerland, where the warden was sympathetic to the idea of priests and ministers living in prison, not as chaplains, but as prisoners. My identity was no longer the warden, lived in a cell, worked at a cement factory eight hours a day, and simply tried, as De Foucault wrote, Créer l'Evangile par ton cœur. Cry the gospel with your life. Communicate through friendship, values. You can't communicate through preaching and teaching because the people you're with don't go to church anyway. I returned to the States and with four other Franciscans went down to Bio Lavatory, Alabama. For two years I worked in a shrimp boat. The shrimpers weren't coming to church, so we tried to bring the church to the shrimpers. 73 to 75 was two more years of campus ministry in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And that summer with the publication of my first book, uh, Prophets and Lovers, my ministry of being a vagabond evangelist began. In 1982, after a seven-year courtship, Rosalind, who's from New Orleans, and I married, and of course the marriage of a celibate Catholic priest of 26 years made me something of a persona non grata in the eyes of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. So as the doors closed for ministry there, many windows have opened in a wide uh, Protestant and evangelical world. It's really been a meaningful life and sometimes an adventurous one. But I'd like to close this morning by sharing with you the decisive moment in my own journey with Jesus of Nazareth. In the winter of 1968, I was living in the Saragossa Desert in Spain, in a cave some 6,000 feet above the sea. I was there for seven months in complete solitude. I never saw another human face, never heard the sound of a human voice. On Sundays, a man from the village of Farlete Bello came up on a burrow, and he dropped off in a designated spot, food, drinking water, kerosene for the lamp. As you entered the cave on the right, there was a little chapel, the stone altar, uh, and there was a, a tabernacle that looked like a treasure chest made out of wrought iron with red velvet interlaced. There was a tall standing crucifix behind the altar. On the left, there was a stone slab that served as a bed, a few potato sacks for a mattress, a stone I still have to cook with, the kerosene lamp. I got up every night at 2 a.m. for what we used to call in the old church nocturnal adoration. I go to the chapel and try and spend at least one hour in praise and thanksgiving to God. On the night of December 13th, 1968, during what began as a long and lonely hour of prayer, I heard in faith Jesus Christ say, for love of you, I left my father's side, and I came to you, who ran from me, who fled me, who did not want to hear my name. For you, I was covered with spit, punched, beaten, and fixed to the wood of the cross. My friends, that was over 30 years ago, and this morning, in an hour of quiet time in my room, 
I realized those words are still burned on my life. That night in the cave, I looked at the crucifix a long time, figuratively saw the blood streaming from every wound and pore in Christ's body, and I heard the cry of his blood. This isn't a joke. It is not a laughing matter to me that I have loved you. The longer I look, the more I realize that no man has ever loved me and no woman could ever love me as he does. I went out in the darkness and I shattered into the night. Jesus, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind to have loved me so much? I learned that night what a beautiful old man told me. Day when the seminary, 23 years old, he said, Kid, you will not understand this now. But the day you experience the love in the heart of Jesus Christ, nothing else in the world will ever again seem that beautiful or desirable. How long you been a Christian now? How long you been reading the Bible now? How long you been ministering in youth for Christ now? Do you know in your gut what it is to love and to be loved by the Lord Jesus? What it is to have your love unsatisfied, endured in loneliness? God, a loneliness that's ready to burst your restless, ravenous heart. Have you known for one fleeting moment in your whole Christian life? Or have you known it and forgotten to remember what it was like the day that Jesus burst into the sealed chamber of your heart the pain was taken away. The hole was filled up. You reached out and embraced this sacred man the, in the same intimate way that a man embraces a woman. A woman embraces a man and said to him, come hell or high water, no matter what happens in Iraq, Iran, Bosnia, Somalia, Northern Ireland, Wall Street, your world, your church, I can't walk away from you. My life loses all meaning, direction, and purpose if you are not at the center of my personal history. If that moment has not darkened your life with its brilliance, or if it has in the past and you've forgotten to remember, I don't care how young you are, how old, male, female, clergy, laity, charismatic, traditional, progressive, conservative, you do not understand what Jesus meant by good news, by abundance, fullness of life in the Spirit. And I submit that that's why he called you here by name this week. Yes, called you by name not to scold or frighten or threaten, but to make you aware, aware, with new depth and greater dimension of his relentless tenderness, of his passionate pursuing, healing, reconciling, what G.K. Chesterton called the furious love of God bodied forth in Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, this and this alone is authentic Christianity, not some code of do's and don'ts, not a tedious moralizing, not a list of forbidden commandments. It's surely not an ethic. It's not a moral code. And it's not a philosophy of life. It's a love affair. A love affair. The thrill, the excitement of being loved unconditionally by Jesus. Of falling in love with him. He takes us to the Father. And they pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. Not to be nicer people with better morals. But brand new creations Prophets, lovers, human torches ignited with the flaming spirit of the living God. My prayer for you this morning and throughout this week is just this. That if you haven't already, or if you have in the past and forgotten to remember, that you will come to experience in surpassing measure the incredible passionate joy that I have known in the love of Christ Jesus that you'll go on experiencing it and sharing it with others until that beautiful day when the giving tree will stand in majestic splendor and all of us together will climb up the trunk, swing from the branches, and eat apples forever and ever. Would you gently close your eyes and join me in prayer? In unselfconscious freedom, tune out everybody else around you. And as the old Quaker phrase goes, center down. Sink into the center of your graced being. 
Become aware in faith of the presence of Jesus dwelling within you. Recall his word in John 15, 4, Make your home in me as I make mine in you. And home is a place of welcoming love, non-judgmental acceptance, and a lot of kisses. Now, don't think anything. Don't intend anything. Don't promise to perform anything. Just grow still and let yourself be loved. Like slipping into a tub of hot water, let the love of Jesus seep in, saturate, permeate, penetrate every part of you. It's one thing to understand cognitively that you're loved, and quite another thing to realize it, to experience it, to be in conscious communion with it. If you sense any resistance to letting yourself be loved, whether it be a lack of faith or shame or guilt or self, self-hatred, just present that to Jesus with the words, I can't free myself, Lord, but I know you can set me free.